All right, ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to talk about how economists tend to think. Now, economists can actually approach the world in generally two different points of view. The first point of view is as a, as a scientist. And what we mean by a scientist is they dispassionately develop and test theories about how the world works. Now, this doesn't mean that economists aren't passionate about their subject matter. What it means is they generally don't have an emotional interest in proving whether one theory works better than another theory. They're trying to add to the general understanding of how the world works. Now, in economics, experiments are extremely difficult to conduct. Uh, there are a number of reasons for this. One of the principal reasons is there are way too many variables involved. Um, the size of the economy and the number of economic transactions that occur on a daily basis is in the multiple billions of transactions per day. Uh, one of the other big problems is there are people involved. And whenever there are people involved, you have to be very wary of unintended consequences. So you may tend to conduct an experiment in the economy or on the economy that could cause some financial distress. As a result, we tend to use a lot of historical data and we tend to rely on assumptions. And different assumptions tend to answer different questions. Now, like all sciences, economics relies on models like our, our friendly model airplane here, okay? But economic models are based using diagrams, graphs, and equations. And it's often better to leave out the details in some of these models. So some of the models are really simplistic, like a model airplane, um, because we're trying to prove a general principle rather than a specific detail. Uh, there's a theory known as Occam's Razor, a very, very old theory. Uh, and it basically reads, in all things, the simplest solution is often preferred. So if we have two equal solutions, one is extremely complex, one is much, much more simple usually the simpler solution is going to be the better solution. Now, the first economic model we're going to look at is the circular flow diagram. The circular flow diagram, like all economic models, begins with certain assumptions. The first assumption is that the economy is only made up of two economic actors, firms and households. Now, in the circular flow diagram, Firms own, or households, excuse me, own the factors of production. The three factors of production are land, labor, and capital. And you can see that down here, whoops, excuse me, on what's called the physical flow, which is the inner loop. Now, households own land, labor, and capital that they sell to firms via the market for the factors of production. In exchange for this, households are paid wages, rent, profit, which becomes income for them. Now, the firms take those factors of production and convert them into goods and services which they sell back to households. And this for the firms tends to become revenue. Now on the inner loop, we can see the physical flow where the factors of production and goods and services move. Moving in the opposite direction, the outer loop, we see the monetary flow where money tends to move. Now this is an incredibly simplistic model. Uh, however, it's not a terrible model for the way basic economic transactions take place. It is missing a, a significant economic actor, which is the government. The government would actually be right here in the middle. The government interacts with both firms and households. It buys factors of production. It buys goods and services. But it also taxes factors of production, taxes goods and services. So the government in a modern economy is involved in every stage of the economic transaction. Now, the second economic model that we're looking at is the production possibilities frontier. 
The production possibilities frontier is used to demonstrate the concept of trade-offs. And the trade-off is just the idea that the economy, or excuse me, the trade-off is the idea that to get something, you have to give up something else you want. Uh, like all models, the production possibilities frontier begins with certain assumptions. And the assumption is the economy is only able to produce two goods. In our little production possibilities frontier right now, we're going to say cars and computers. The two goods could be guns or butter. Uh, the two goods could be widgets and gidgets. It doesn't actually matter. We're just beginning with the capital goods and consumption goods would be another example. Uh, we're just beginning with the basic assumption that our economy can only produce two goods. Now, on the production possibilities frontier, if my economy spent its entire time making just computers, they could produce 3,000 computers, but at the same time, they can produce zero cars. Okay, so computers are on one axis, cars are on the other axis. If, on the other hand, my economy spent all of its time producing cars, that would be this point out here, they could produce a thousand cars, but they could produce zero computers. And then my, my economy can actually produce any other number of combinations along this blue line. So, for example, at point A, they could produce 2,200 computers or six, and 600 cars. Or at point B, they could produce 200 fewer computers, but 100 more cars. Now, in economics, we say any point along the line is efficient. So point F is efficient. Point A, point B, and point E is efficient. That means the economy is making the most of its resources. They can't increase production of one good, say computers, point F here. They can't make more computers without making fewer cars, or say go, say go from A to F. Now, any point inside the line, point D right here, is said to be inefficient. What that means is the economy is not using its resources, its land, labor, and capital to the very, very best of its ability. So they could actually produce more computers. Right now at point D, they'd be producing a thousand, excuse me. At point D, they'd be producing a thousand computers and 300 cars. Okay. If they increase production of computers, they could produce probably 1,800 more computers without giving up the production of any cars. Or if they in increase the production of cars, they could probably produce 800 more cars without giving up the production of any computers. And any point outside the line is not possible at this time. Not possible given the land, labor, and capital, and the technology, technology is a form of capital, we currently have. Now, the production possibilities frontier is not static. It can grow. Uh, if we have an increase in land, labor, or capital, the factors of production, we're going to be able to produce more goods and services. So the entire curve is going to shift outward. But what's interesting is, let's say we have an increase in the ability to produce just computers. If that were to happen, my maximum quantity of computers produced is going to increase. So if I spend all my time making computers now, instead of producing 3,000, I can produce 4,000. While at the same time, my maximum quantity of cars is actually going to stay the same. But because of this increase in computer production, along most points of the curve, I could actually, actually have more of both. I could have more computers and more cars. Because the economy can reallocate some resources, let's say workers for example, from making computers 
to now making carbs. Now, the field of economics is broken into two subfields, micro and macro. This is going to be our primary micro focus class. This is focused on how households and firms make decisions. Macroeconomics, by contrast, focuses on the entire economy, uh, the economy in aggregate. Now, the second role of economist is as policy advisor. This is the economist giving advice to politicians, working within government, working within certain institutions like the IMF or the World Bank, and giving advice on how to best manage the economy. They can work in both the executive and the legislative branch. Uh, and while the economist acts as scientist, there's generally, when the economist acts as scientist, there's generally a lot of agreement about their, their, their work. Okay, they make what are what we tend to call positive statements or statements that describe how the world is. When they act as policy advisors, there tends to be much more disagreement. When economists act as policy advisors, they're much more likely to make a normative statement or a statement that describes how the world ought to be. Now, I have some examples of positive and normative. So the unemployment rate is 7.2%. That is a positive statement. That is a provable statement. Illegal immigration hurts American workers. That is a normative statement. Uh, in order to make that a positive statement, you would have to provide some evidence. Um, when you make a statement, hurts, harms, without evidence, you're generally making a normative statement. We should balance the federal budget. This is also a normative statement. A college degree doubles an average worker's lifetime earnings. This is a positive statement. We could look at the evidence and prove whether this is true or false. Schools are underfunded. This is a normative statement because we don't know the appropriate level of funding for schools. Uh, these are 10 propositions that most economists would agree on. You could read these on your own. And I have a little pop quiz for you. Question number one, what are the two roles an economist plays? Question number two, what are all economic models based on? Question number three, what is Occam's razor? All right, thank you for your attention today. Have a great day.